Our third speaker for tonight is Dr. Pureg Okain. He's originally from Ireland, hence my poor pronunciation of his name, uh, where he completed a PhD in mathematics. Before coming to Australia three years ago, he currently works at Monash, but is on the move again, and from September will be at Alto University in Helsinki. Pureg. All right. So I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak, um, and Norm Doe for pressuring me into this. If uh, you enjoyed the talk, tell me. If you didn't, tell Norm. So, all right. I'm here to talk about James Joseph Sylvester, who was a British mathematician in the 19th century. Um, he was born in 1814. He was the son of Abraham Joseph, who was a Jewish merchant in the city of London. Now, he had an elder brother who was John Joseph, and he was James Joseph, and these guys all seem to have a lot of middle names Joseph, right? It's because that was their surname. Um, it turns out that the elder brother, John Joseph, went to the US, and the story is that he needed a Christian name, a middle name, and a surname before he could be immigrated. I told you he was Jewish, right? Um, so he chose Sylvester. And we don't really know why. This was like at least 30 years before Sylvester Stallone was famous. Uh, ditto Sylvester the cat. There was only one famous Sylvester that seems to have been around before that, and that was a Pope Sylvester around the year 800, who was famous for three things. He introduced Arabic numerals to Europe, which is some sort of scientific achievement. Um, he was also interested in witchcraft and uh, enchanted a bronze head with a demon, and it could talk, and it told him not to go to Jerusalem, and he went to Jerusalem, and the devil stole him. <laughs> it seems being Catholic was more interesting back then. Uh, and the third thing he was famous for was, like, exceptional, even in those days, hostility towards the Jews. Interesting, interesting choice for a Jew emigrating to uh, America. But anyway, the brother went to America, became John Joseph Sylvester. James Joseph decided he needed a cooler name, so he became James Joseph Sylvester. And he has, well, there are two things we need to understand about James Joseph from day one. His one goal in life is to become professor of mathematics at a respectable university. He's in Britain in the 19th century. There are two respectable universities, Oxford and Cambridge. The other thing we need to remember is he has an enormous ego from day one. So by the age of 14, things are looking good. He's been enrolled in University College London uh, under Augustus de Morgan, and he's studying mathematics. Um, and things seem to be going well until someone makes a wise crack at lunch one day, uh, possibly something about Jews. Sylvester grabs a steak knife and threatens the student, as you do. Uh, Augustus de Morgan was upset that one of his students had been, well, threatened or pos possibly stabbed, we don't know, and expelled him from the university. His parents decided that at 14, maybe he was a little bit too young to go to university, so they sent him to boarding school in Liverpool. Now, the brother in New York is friends with the director of lotteries for the United States, and they have some sort of combinatorial problem. We don't know what it was, um, and this... John Joseph, persuades them to send this problem to a 15-year-old delinquent in Liverpool. Um, and the, the most surprising thing is James Joseph solves the problem. And he solves it to the satisfaction of the US lottery, and they send him a check for $500. That's worth about $10,000 in today's money. And, well, we don't know what happened to the money or to Sylvester in this period, but if you want to find out, find yourself a 15-year-old, give them $10,000. <laughs> and ask them to provide accounts afterwards. <laughs> so Sylvester, again, was not particularly happy in Liverpool. Possibly there were anti-Semitic jokes again. He runs away, jumps on a mail boat, and escapes to Dublin, back to Ireland. Um, and this is the one time in Sylvester's life that he actually has a run of good luck. He's accosted by a judge of the Supreme Court of Ireland uh, in the street, who recognizes him, drags him away to put him in detention, but then realizes that the judge is married to Sylvester's cousin. They bring him home, feed him, clothe him, send him back to his parents, and he vanishes from history for a year or two. By the age of 17, he's enrolled in Cambridge, so things seem to be, once again, looking up. Um, this time, it's uneventful. There are no, there's no violence. Um, he's sick for a year or two, and he's about 23 by the time he comes to take his final exams. Um, and he places second in the, the tripos, which is the mathematical exams at Cambridge. And this is quite an achievement, because uh, oh, what's his name? 
his first name is gone, Green, famous for Green's functions, places fourth. And Green is 40, he's been studying maths for 20 years. So placing second is pretty impressive. We don't know what happened to the people who came first or th third, they vanished. Because um, being good at exams is not the same thing as being good at maths. But no, Sylvester had a bright future in front of him. But uh, to graduate from Oxford or to graduate from Cambridge, you had to sign your name to some sort of assertion about the 39 articles which involve loyalty to the Queen and acceptance of Anglicanism and all sorts of things. And Sylvester is a Jew. As far as we know, he's not at all religious, but uh, he's stubborn. And he refuses to sign this thing. So that, that entire career, uh, graduate, get a scholarship, become a professor at Cambridge, is closed off. Oh well. He vanishes again for 18 months. He, he turns up. He has a BA and an MA from Trinity in Dublin which seems to have similar rules, but is mostly focused on keeping Catholics out, so a Jew slips through the cracks. Now, <laughs> Sylvester is about 25. He's got a BA, he's got an MA. They don't award PhDs in the 19th century in Britain. Uh, so he's, he's qualified. Augustus de Morgan has gotten over the fact that he tried to kill one of his students and offers him a position as professor of physics at University College London. This is quite a step up in the world for a 25-year-old. Uh, unfortunately, um, well, the, the idea of Sylvester in a, in a lab full of glassware and undergraduates is worrying. Uh, it turns out that UCL or no other university in London, uh, in Britain, actually had a lab in the 19th century. It was all theoretical, so it's not, not so much to worry about. But um, Sylvester is not really good at gratitude. He wants to be a professor of mathematics at Oxford, remember, or Cambridge. Either will do. So three or four months in, he hears about this job in the University of Virginia. Uh, which is professor of mathematics, and he says, Augustus de Morgan, thanks for this cha you know, chance, but I'm leaving, see ya. And he heads for Virginia. Now, students in the 19th century, anywhere, were pretty rough and unruly. It was not, not easy teaching them. Virginia, were, they were famous for their drunkenness and lawlessness. Shortly before Sylvester arrived, they killed a professor. <laughs> not a word of a lie. Um, and this, this, remember, also is in the south of America, not South America, but south of that Mason-Dixon line, before the War of Independence. These people are slave owners. Uh, Sylvester has quite a good record with human rights, and he has an abhorrence of slavery. He's also a pretty terrible teacher. Um, for, for some reason, he got into a dispute with a student by the name of William Ballard from New Orleans. Uh, he offended this southern gentleman's code of honor. So, what do you do if you're a southern gentleman and your honor has been offended? You gather up your friends, get them big sticks, and hide down a dark alleyway. Um, and they did, and Sylvester wandered by thinking about mathematics, uh, and they all rush out, and they knock his top hat off, and they give him a scalp wound, but Sylvester has heard these stories about unruly students and is pretty paranoid about his own personal safety, so he has a sword cane. <laughs> He unsheathes it and fights them all off, ninja style, um, and stabs William H. Ballard in the chest. And this guy falls back and he says, I am killed, because the, the, uh, the obituaries are written in the 19th century and it's, they're all dramatic. Uh, the friends vanish. Uh, a bystander says, Sylvester, you better get out of here. Um, it turns out afterwards that he hasn't killed him. It glanced off a, a rib and it's only a chest wound. But uh, Sylvester heads north. He's going to hide out in his brother's basement until the heat cools down. Um, and he stops only once on the way north. And he stops and he sends a letter to Harvard and a letter to Columbia saying that he's back on the job market. <laughs> and they, they, they hear the news and they, uh, they respond. And you would imagine you killed one of your students would be a sufficient reason to not, uh, to not hire this guy. But their actual response is, we don't think it would be acceptable to hire a Jew. So, Two, two jobs down, neither one lasted longer than six months. Sylvester decides it's time to go back to London. <laughs> off he goes. And te teaching is probably off the cards for a little while. So Sylvester decides that he's going to uh, study actu actuarial science. And he, he's an actuary. He works in life assurance for five or six years. And then he starts to study law, maybe to better defend himself in future. <laughs> um, and while he's there, he meets Arthur Cayley, who's another young mathematician who's studying law. He's going to go into conveyancing. And these guys spend their lunch times walking around in London discussing mathematics. Uh, and this goes on for a few years until Sylvester hears about a job at the Woolwich Naval Academy in 
in, near London, um, and he applies. He's ranked second. The guy who gets it lasts less than a year. He dies in mysterious circumstances. <laughs> Sylvester was never, never questioned or anything, but he, he got the job. And now, <laughs> Sylvester settles down. He is constantly in dispute with his students, with the staff of the college, with the board of directors, everybody. But this is the most productive period of his life, mathematically. So we should talk a little bit about what he did. Now, we heard from Kobe about uh, Florence Nightingale, who popularized statistics. She learned from Sylvester. He was probably her most famous student. Uh, apart from that, uh, so the private students were maybe more successful, college stuff not so much. Uh, apart from that, Sylvester contributed to every area of maths that existed in his day. He was passionate about everything. Um, his main contributions were to the area of partitions, which is an area of number theory, which was, he did most of the best work that was done in the 19th century on this area. Uh, he worked in invariant theory, which is where he spent most of his time working. And if you haven't heard of invariant theory, that's because the first thing David Hilbert did about 30 years later was say the main answer, that the answer to the main question of invariant theory is yes, and the subject died. <laughs> but to the extent that you don't need to know what the question was. Um, but no, what, uh, I guess what Sylvester and Cayley's main contribution to mathematics was, was the development of linear algebra. So in the 1840s, a guy called Hamilton, and I couldn't give a talk without mentioning Hamilton, he's Irish, um, had invented the Quaternions, which were a non-commutative uh, number system. So commu commutativity means, well, if you have a system that's commutative, the order in which you carry out your operations doesn't matter. If I stick out my hands, I turn my left hand over, turn my right hand over, turn my left hand over, right and back where I started. If I take my shoes off, and then I take my socks off, and then put my shoes back on, and then I put my socks back on, think about it. I am not back where I started. <laughs> S some mornings it happens. But um, that's, that's a non-commutative operation. And for a long time, uh, I mean, math math mathematicians have been aware that not everything was commutative, but they've just pushed it under the rug. To the extent that 20 years after Hamilton's invention, Lewis Carroll writes Alice in Wonderland, a large part of that is an attack on non-commutative number systems. Uh, Lewis Carroll thinks they're ridiculous. But anyway, three or four years after Hamilton invents these, Cayley and Sylvester get word of it, and they start thinking about the underlying systems. And what they come up with is the theory of linear algebra. Before this, n-dimensional space is something weird, and maybe, maybe it exists, maybe it doesn't. Different people think different things. They make it boring and pedestrian. This is a huge achievement. Um, in, in, in that it becomes the language you use to talk about other mathematics. Um, the other thing that they did was they invented matrices, these square things that we persecute first-year students by forcing them to multiply, uh, matrix inversion and so on. But um, it's, it's extraordinarily successful. The, the results that they, that they laid out and proved are so, so clear and so obvious to us now that we really don't appreciate what an achievement it was at the time. Um, so I think linear algebra was important. Now, Sylvester's other great, um, other great achievement was naming things. Uh, Sylvester loved Greek, he loved Latin, French, German, any language you can think of. And one of his great pleasures was inventing names for things. Uh, so we couldn't do linear algebra without a matrix. And Sylvester coined the term, and this is the definition that he gave. A matrix, a rectangular array of terms out of which different systems of determinants may be engendered as from the womb of a common parent. <laughs> Why not? Matrix is the Latin word for womb. And OK, there were, there were lots of other words. So we heard from Ian Wanless last month about how Euler invented graph theory. We don't know what he called it, because Sylvester coined the term graph. Um, he also introduced lots of other words like invariant, covariant, discriminant, umbral, to mean to do with the spectrum of a matrix, uh, annihilators, Jacobians, minors, canonical forms, and syzygies. That's syzygy with two y's and a z. Because he, he likes complicated words. Some of them were a little bit too complicated. Um, Allotrius factor, analogmatic pavement, catalecticant, ooh, mecatectisiant, mm, those ones didn't take off. Um, but no, so Sylvester did quite a lot. And the other thing, as I said, he had an enormous ego. He would have been good at selling himself to grant writing committees. This, this is what he said about himself. Perhaps I may, without a modesty, lay claim to the appellation of mathematical Adam, as I believe that I've given more names passed into general circulation to the creatures of mathematical reason than all other mathematicians of the age combined. <laughs> right? 
why, why restrict it to your age, Sylvester? <laughs> but um, yeah, he, he had a giant ego. And I mean, okay, we can't, we can't just talk about the good sides. There were, there were bad sides as well. So Sylvester was too busy having good ideas and writing them down to uh, read much of the work of other mathematicians. So he tended to invent other things that people had come up with already. So he, his last great contribution to mathematics in particular, when he was in his 70s, was to develop a, a theory of infinitesimal groups and symmetries of differential equations, which was quite impressive, except that Lee had come up with it 20 years before. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he also has the dubious honor of being the last great mathematician to work without a formal definition for a function, which Euler also had introduced. But um, yeah, so he didn't have time really to read the work of other mathematicians. He also didn't really have time to write down proofs. I mean, he, he would do exactly what we chastise students for now. He would prove something for n equals 2 and maybe for n equals 3 and then say he was certain that it was true in the general case, but didn't really have time to write it down. And a lot of the time it was true. Some of the time it wasn't. Yeah, his, his papers are difficult to read. Yeah, so um, yeah, he didn't always write down rigorous proofs. And the other thing that he was famous for was getting into these prolonged disputes with other mathematicians. It's the giant ego thing again. His main contribution to design theory was claiming to have invented design theory. Um, yeah, he, he, did, he did other things as well, but yeah, it was mostly, most, mostly arguments. So, um, yes, where are we? We are now in 1876, Sylvester is 55. He's been battling students, staff of Woolwich Naval Academy for 15 years. Um, he's just turned 55. He has, well, gotten into some sort of extremely bitter dispute with the university and some sort of termination agreement is agreed. Uh, he is six weeks shy of 15 years service, so they try and not give him a pension. And Sylvester reacts as we would expect. There are no fatalities, but he takes it to every, every venue that he can find, to the letters page of the Times, and it only ends when the Prime Minister of the day, Gladstone, weighs in and insists that Sylvester gets a half pension. And surprisingly, I guess, Sylvester takes the half and stops fighting. But um, Sylvester now has time to engage in his other great passions, which are everything else. He likes music, he likes chess, and he likes poetry. So he spends a year or two writing a little book that he calls The Law of Verse, with capitals, um, where he lays out a mathematical theory of how one should write poetry. Um, he takes singing lessons with Charles Gounod, a famous composer of the day, uh, a few other bits and pieces. And then all of a sudden, he hears word of uh, a new position that's been created in Baltimore. Johns Hopkins University is being founded, and the, uh, the founder has been told, hire the best mathematician you can afford. Mathematics is pretty cheap, and you can't have a good university without it. And they approach Sylvester, and Sylvester is a little bit wary about going to the US after last time's experience, so he decides that he will have a salary of $5,000 a year paid in gold. That's about seven kilos of gold a year. And why not? Now, Sylvester arrives, and he is tasked with setting up a research-intensive university and a research group in mathematics. And he achieves spectacular results. He founds the American Journal of Mathematics, still one of the more important, important journals. Um, he's not really expected to teach, which is just as well. His first class is, well, one student comes up and pesters him. He wants to says, I want to learn the modern algebra. So Sylvester says, Okay, and he starts just lecturing about whatever he's been thinking about recently. And this, this, this is what that student said. He said, to know him was to know one of the historic figures of all time, one of the immortals. And when he was really moved to speak, his eloquence equaled his genius. So if this guy wrote stuff like that on his exam paper, I'd imagine he did pretty well. <laughs> um, so Sylvester is having the time of his life. These are his golden years at Johns Hopkins. He's in his 60s. Um, he's doing maths, proper maths. He's doing a little bit of teaching when the fancy takes him. And uh, he decides at some point that he's going to train these savages in the art of poetry. So he writes, he writes a new poem for the occasion. It's 400 lines long. It's called Rosalind. And every line ends, well, rhymes with Rosalind. And he's going to allow the long eye and the short eye. So Sylvester decides that he's going to give a reading of this po poem. And perhaps the most surprising thing in this entire talk is that the audience turns up. The room is filled. Everyone wants to hear what Sylvester has to say. Um, now, unfortunately, Sylvester never wrote anything without copious footnotes, including poetry. Uh, and to 
avoid disrupting the flow of this magnificent poem, he decided to read all the footnotes first. <laughs> and then every footnote suggested a digression, and the digression suggested further important information that had to be imparted. And yeah, 90 minutes passed, uh, Sylvester just meandering along, and then he caught an eye of the clock, and he went beetroot. And he apologized for the inconvenience he'd caused everyone, and then started reading the poem. Now, it was a very special treat for you. I have a few lines from the poem. I'm not going to read all 400. God help us, I haven't the strength. But um, before I do, I would need one footnote. Johanna Lind was one of the best-known sopranos of the day. She was called the Swedish Nightingale. And as I say, Sylvester really liked music, and when he got more carried away in his footnotes, he used to compare music to maths. He said, hold on, let me get this. Is music not... I didn't write this one down. Is music not the mathematics of the senses? Is mathematics not the music of reason? Maybe. But anyway, uh, he got more carried away. He started talking about the Euler Mozart, or the Gauss Beethoven, um, as, as you do, because you can compare musicians and mathematicians or just hyphenate them and turn them into like a, a symbiotic being. Um, anyway, that's enough of a digression. With each mortal thing unkind, heaven's light comforting the blind, to those tones of Orpheus twinned, that could death's decrees rescind, soft as notes of Jenny Lind, <laughs> ear by time's harsh sickle thinned, thy sweet name, dear Rosalind. Please don't ask me afterwards what that was about. <laughs> um, yeah, he, was, he, he enjoyed poetry, but it was not his, his great gift. So yeah, these, these were Sylvester's golden years, and now things are about to get a little bit better. Smith, of Smith Normal Form fame, uh, an Irish mathematician, was civilian professor of geometry at Oxford. He dies. And they've rescinded the, uh, the laws about no Jews being allowed into Oxford and so on, and they offer the position to Sylvester, and Sylvester says, sure thing, see you Baltimore. Um, and he heads back, and he's, he spends this, the last 10 years of his career, so from the ages of about 70 to 80, working in Oxford, it turns out not to be quite as happy as Baltimore. They don't really have a culture of research. I mean, he works hard during these years to reinvent Lee theory and to um, invite mathematicians from Europe to visit the UK and to collaborate with people there. Um, but it's, it's not as exciting as it had been. So I would prefer to leave Sylvester in front of his admiring audience reading atrocious poetry. Um, and just to say a little bit about his, his legacy. For Sylvester, he wasn't, he wasn't so interested in abstraction and in big ideas. He cared about the little things. So this, this is a, a judgment of his mathematics. Sylvester's writings are flowery and eloquent. He was able to make the dullest subject bright, fresh, and interesting. His enthusiasm is evident in every line. He would get quite close up to his subject so that everything else looked small in comparison, and for the time would think and would make others think that the world contained no finer matter for contemplation. And besides, quite besides his mathematics, he wrote about 4,000 pages of papers. Uh, Cayley wrote another 7,000. But um, quite aside from the mathematics, um, he was a very likable human being when he wasn't assaulting people. Um, he, in his own opinion, introduced mathematics to America. And to a large extent, he did. Um, he was the first Jewish professor in America. He was the first Jewish professor at, um, at Oxford or Cambridge. Um, and yeah, in, in his own words, he was a very great genius. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>